says that they that know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. They that know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. It's not those that are weak. It is not those that do not know their God. It's not those that only know God through other people. Hallelujah. It's not those that only know God through what prophets are telling them. If anyone gives you a prophecy that is not in line with the word of God, throw it away. Throw it away. As long as it is not in line with the word of God, know that it is not yours. That prophecy is not yours, no matter what the person is saying. Hallelujah. So we are discussing 10 truths, 10 powerful truths that every, about God that every Christian should know. 10 powerful truths about God that every Christian should know. The first thing is that is the fact that God is good. God is a good God. Our God is a good God. Like I told you in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief is the one that comes, the devil is the one that comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. But Christ came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The psalmist said that, taste and see that the Lord is good. So there is no two way about it. Don't let the devil sell you the lie that God is the one punishing you. If you commit anything, the moment you confess, if you can confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. And as far as the east is from the west, so far will he remove all your sins away from you. So the moment you ask for forgiveness, don't even go back there. Don't be like a dog that goes back to its vomit, thinking that, oh, ha, um, it is God punishing me for what I did in the past. If you sinned against God in the past, ask for forgiveness. And the moment you ask for forgiveness, believe that you have received that forgiveness and move on. Don't let the devil sell you a lie that something happened to you because God is punishing you for what you did in the past. No, we need to avoid the devil attacking our faith through this, um, th th this, this feeling of um, um, we are not good enough. We, can, we cannot go into the presence of God. God is a wicked God. He punishes. No. Can you imagine serving a God that is not good? Can you imagine serving a God that is selfish, that does evil, that is cruel, that is mean, that every time you do something wrong, all he does is punish you? I had an analogy recently, and it really... Um, resonated with me. The teacher was talking about the fact that if you have a child, I'm a parent as well. If you're a parent, you, 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 you identify with me in this. If you have a child and you told your child every, that every day, this is what you're supposed to do. This is the household chore that you're supposed to do. But this child refuses to do what you tell him to do. And you didn't know and the child now went outside to play while he was playing outside with his friends someone hurt him and you just heard him screaming ah, i'm hurt i'm hurt i'm hurt will you say because that child has not done the chores or the things that you told him to do will you leave that child to be punished by the devil or uh, to be punished by someone else outside Will you leave that child to be punished by someone else else or to be hurt by someone else outside? That is the picture that some of us paint about God. God is a good God. He's not a mean God. It is, he is not an evil God. Only good and perfect gifts come from him. God is a good God. And God at his core, at his very being is good. 
and every thought and action he thinks or does is also good. All of his plans are good and he desires only good for us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it, it tells us that I know the thoughts that I have towards you. That is, even all what he's thinking about you are good things. He's not thinking evil, any evil about you at all. So know that fact that the God we serve is good. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. God is not selfish. God is not vindictive. God is not cruel. God does not punish. Some people would say, uh, God is punishing me with this sickness. No. God is not punish, is not a punisher. God is not a punisher. The psalmist even testifies to it that your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That is even when you scold me, when you try to turn, you, you are just doing it to turn me in the right direction. They comfort me. So please let that lie be debunked today that God is a good God. He is not a God that punishes. Hallelujah. God is good. That's number one. And then number two, God exists in three persons. God exists in three persons. They as an, we as, in the English word, in the dictionary, they have um, coined the word Trinity to represent the three persons of God. But it means that God is one, and at the same time, God is three separate persons who operate in perfect unity. The first person of the Trinity is God Almighty, the God that was spoken about in the beginning in Genesis. That is the God Almighty. He has several names. He has no beginning and he has no end. That is, he is eternal. He has all the wisdom, all the knowledge and understanding and understanding. And then the second person of the Godhead is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The second person is Jesus. His name is the word. What we are being told in John chapter one, verse one, that in the beginning was the word. That is in Genesis, in the beginning, when God was creating the world, that Jesus was the word at that time. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, hallelujah. So the three personas of, G of God are still the same thing. So don't let um, anybody deceive you like you hear some doctrine saying that we believe in God the Father. Some people will say, no, we only believe in God the Son, Jesus Christ. And some will say, no, we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. No, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, and the third person, which is the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the one who came into the world as a man in flesh, even though he was like God, he came as a man in flesh so that he might take away her sins. He died as a propitiation for our sins. That is what the Bible tells us. He, he died, he was crucified, he died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day victoriously to ascend to heaven and live forever with the Father. So the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And even Jesus told his disciples then that he needs to go so that he can send the Holy Spirit. So these are not myths. They are all this persona of Christ of God are represented in the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, that is Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, who is the Comforter that Jesus promised us while He was here on earth before He was crucified, before He died. So please don't let anybody um, confuse you and say, "Ah, we belong to um, God the Father." No, we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is one. God is one. The Trinity are one. 
It's just that the operation of each person differs. That is just that the persons of God. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit is the comforter, the advocate, the encourager, the one who teaches us all things, the one who brings all things to our remembrance. Like when you are forgetting something, you just pray to God. Like recently, I was to travel with my husband and I was looking for my identity document. And I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, ah, I know that I am not careless with this thing. I was not careless. What exactly? And the Holy Spirit told me that if you can find a particular document that you used it with the last time, you will find your ID document, my identity document. And I was asking my husband, where is this particular document? Paper. Where is this particular paper? I know that if I find this paper, I will find my ID document. I searched everywhere. I couldn't find that thing until I found it in the car and my ID was right next to it. So God, the Holy Spirit teaches us all things, even the minute things of life. If we can learn to trust him and lean on him for wisdom, lean on him for help, he is a great helper that Jesus promised us. So we should not, he will not force himself on you. So note that the Holy Spirit is there for you. Hallelujah. Number three thing I want us to know about God. The number three truth is the fact that God forgives. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I want to emphasize it. I, number one is that God is good. Number two is that God exists in three persons. You, you will hear so many things out there. Ah, we belong to God the Father. We belong to... No, all three of them are one. You cannot believe in God the Father and not believe in God the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's not right. Because they, they, they all serve different purposes in the kingdom. Hallelujah. So please don't let anyone deceive you. God forgives. Sin came into the word world when Adam sinned, when he disobeyed God. Hallelujah. And sin created a barrier between God and us. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, we are told that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in him. He was in all ways tempted as we are. So don't say that, ah, oh, this temptation is too great. No, Jesus was also tempted. He was hungry. He was a, I'm sure he was a very handsome man. He was also like tempted around women. But the Bible tells us that yet without sin. Yet without sin. The sin barrier that came when Hedam sinned was removed when Jesus died and was um, buried and he rose again on the third day. So that sin barrier was removed. Jesus already paid the price for your sin. None of us that is alive now was alive when Jesus died over 2,000 years ago. When, so he died for the sins of everybody that is alive right now. So nobody can be in a position to judge another person as, ah, this one is a sinner, they cannot make heaven. No, Jesus died for everybody. Jesus, God forgives us all our sins because of Jesus' death on the cross and the fact that he rose again. He conquered death in victory. Hallelujah. Jesus conquered death in victory for us. Colossians 2 verses 13 to 14 says that God made us alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. All our sins were forgiven at the cross. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it all to the cross. So don't go and pick. Jesus already nailed those sins to the cross. Don't go and pick it again. 
Don't let the devil sell you the lie that, that you are not forgiven. Don't fall into the trap of condemnation. There is a Romans tells us is it um, Romans chapter eight that there is therefore now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. So don't let any man fool you. Don't let any man deceive you that this thing, that there's a particular thing that God cannot forgive. No, God forgives. He is a forgive, he's a loving God. He does not hold on to sin. The psalmist said that you have not dealt with me according to the measure of my sins. If God was to count sins, who will stand? Nobody. No human being will stand. Even the little righteousness we claim to have, the Bible says, are like filthy rags before him. So no man by himself can become righteous. But righteousness, salvation is a gift from God. Receive it wholeheartedly. Forgiveness is a gift from God. Receive it wholeheartedly. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise that God has not forgiven you. Hallelujah. God forgives. Hallelujah. God forgives. He is not a God that holds your sin against you. His anger endures but for a moment. Hallelujah. He's a merciful God. His anger endures but for a moment. And then number four, I've taught this before, but it's a truth that we still need to emphasize so that people will not buy the, with the lie of the devil. The number four thing is that God has a plan for us. Aren't you glad? God has a plan for us. Yo, from the book of Genesis to Revelation, in the Bible, it is apparent that God has a plan for every believer. God, God has so much woven our lives into each other like a masterpiece. You, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He calls me the apple of his eyes. He has a plan for me, a plan to give me a future and a hope. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Ah, his thoughts towards me, his plan for me, is for me to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that my leaves are evergreen. He's the, he's the God that's, that, that um, in Psalm 23, is it verse four or five, that preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil and my cup runs over. Ah, this God is too much. I'm telling you, it's planned for us is to prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies that they will just be looking at you, but they cannot do anything to you. Um, there's an adage in my language that says that um, when, you, you know that traditionally the N eats corn, they eat maize, corn or maize, maize meal. So, if you put a corn inside a bottle and the bottle is covered, the end will just be looking at that corn and cannot eat it. It will just be looking at it and behind it. It will just be behind it, but it cannot eat it. That is, God has put us in him. God is like the bottle in which we are. He has kept us in him that the enemy will just be looking at us from afar and they cannot arm us. That is the type of plan that God has for us. Believe it. Don't let the devil sell you the light that God has no plan for you. Don't believe the light, light that your life is over. No. God has a plan for us. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for me. And my plan will not disturb your plan. Your plan will not disturb my plan because he has a separate plan for every single one of us. So please don't let the devil sell you the lie that no, um, God doesn't have a plan for you. You should just end it now. Life, your life has ended. No, 
don't join them to believe that lie. Your life has not ended. It's, God is just starting with you. Enter into his plan and purpose for your life and you will see wonders. His plan is to make you a lender unto many nations and not to be a borrower. If you can just follow his word, if you can just obey all the instructions that he gives you. Number five, which will be the last point that we are going to discuss today is the fact that God speaks to us. Oh, hallelujah. The God we serve speaks to us. When we became born again, we invited God to be our father. We invited Jesus Christ, the second person of God, to be our Lord and personal savior. And we invited the Holy Spirit to dwell in our spirits. All three of them want to communicate with us. Learning to hear the voice of God takes time and practice. Just like a child who is learning to walk, when you have a baby, when a baby is still small, like the first few months of that baby's life, they are still growing. At a point, that baby will crawl. And then at a point, that baby will start trying to walk. But that baby cannot just start, stand one day and start walking. And they are walking all over the place. Baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. So learning to hear the voice of God is also like taking baby steps. It takes time and it takes practice. It requires getting quiet before God and listening for his voice to speak to your spirit. Learn, and also learning to cut away the influences that try to drown out his voice. God is always near. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. God is always near. God is always near. If you think you cannot hear him physically or you are not quiet enough, take his word. Take the Bible. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us in our spirit. Hallelujah. He is always near and always ready to fill her heart and mind with his love, with the promises that he has given us, if only we allow him. He is such a loving and merciful God that he does not impose himself on us the way we try to impose ourselves or our opinion on other people. No, he does not impose himself on us. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open for me, I will come in. Open for Christ today. Open your heart. Let him speak to you. And if you think you are not yet at that level where you are hearing from him in your spirit, then take the Bible. Read the Bible. None of us has an excuse not to study the word. Thank God for technology. Technology has removed all those excuses. I'll still, I'll keep saying this every day, every time we meet like this. The technology has removed all those excuses for us. It has removed the excuses. You have audible Bible. You have it on your phone. You have it on tablets, iPad, laptop. You can hear someone reading it to your ears. Hi. What exactly is your excuse for not studying the word? Nothing. You have no excuse. Don't tell me there's no time. Make time out of no time. Make time out of no time. Even if you have to deny yourself some extra 30 minutes of sleep. Make time to study the word. Make time to know your God. Like I started, that the book of, in the book of Daniel, we're told that they that know their God, they are the ones that will be strong. 
and that will do exploits. It's time that we do more exploits for God. We just don't want to read about God's generals. We all can be God's generals. We all can raise the dead. We all can cause the blind to, to see. We can lift up the lame and they will walk because of the power of God that is within us. The Bible says that we'll lay our hands on the sick and they will recover. People, it's high time we debunk all those lies. We debunked all those lies that the devil is selling to people out there. Don't just listen to this alone. Be a hearer and a doer of the word. And not only a doer, share it with people. Teach others what you have been taught. Teach others what you have been taught. Don't be selfish with it. So today we have dealt with five of the 10 truths, powerful truths about God that every Christian should know so that you will not be tossed to and fro by the winds of doctrine. The first one we talked about today is the fact that God is good. God is a good God. He's not a God that punishes. He's not a God that will punish you with illness or bring evil. He's not selfish. He's not an evil God. The number two thing we studied is the fact that God has three persons. That is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So don't let anyone tell you that, no, we belong to God the Father, we belong to God the Son, we don't believe in God the Holy Spirit. The three are one, according to the scriptures. The three are one. And the English word that has been coined to represent them is the word Trinity. Trinity, three in one person. Hallelujah. And then the third thing that we talked about was the fact that God forgives. He's a forgiving God. No matter your sin, he has forgiven you. Hallelujah. There's no sin that is greater. There's no sin that is smaller. Sin is sin, but glory be to God, he has forgiven us all our sins. The number four thing we talked about is the fact that God has a plan for us. God has a plan for us. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for me. Just go to him and ask him that plan for you. His plans for you are perfect. Walk in them and you will live a victorious life. And the fifth thing we talked about today is the fact that God speaks to us. God speaks to us. He is not far. He is always near to tell you things. He said, call on to me and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So, those are the five things we have learned today. We'll learn the remaining five next week, Wednesday. So till then, when you hear from me again, stay blessed, stay safe, and remember that Jesus is Lord. Bye.